Hello, my name is Tom Furman. I'm an anesthesiologist critical care specialist in Florida. I'm also a member of the Respiratory Compromise uh, Institute, and we have been doing some work over the last several years looking at respiratory compromise. And as an anesthesiologist, I'm very much concerned about the idea of respiratory compromise in surgical patients. So I'll walk you through what I know about it, what we know about it, and maybe something we can do about it. To reiterate, if you haven't looked it up before, respiratory compromise is a state, and what we're looking at is that doing nothing for these patients will probably allow them or they will fall into respiratory insufficiency or failure. Selected patients. We don't know which ones at the moment, but when a patient is at risk for respiratory compromise, what we think is possible is that if you do specific interventions, whether it's enhanced monitoring, maybe therapies or so, you might prevent or, or stop this decompensation into respiratory compromise, and that's what our goal is. Now, just to give you an idea of the scope of the problem, respiratory compromise is the second leading avoidable patient safety issue in the United States. Medical errors are number one. It is experienced by almost 14 patients out of every 1,000 hospitalized patients following surgery. You know, 14 out of 1,000 doesn't seem like many, but if you're in a busy hospital, that starts adding up. Go to your surgery part and ask them how many operations they do a year and figure it out. That can be a high number. Right now, we're looking back at data from years ago because it takes so long to collect it and such, but back in 2007, it cost American hospitals almost $8 billion because of respiratory compromise. Another bad thing to look at is that your patient's mortality rate increases over 30%, and the increase in the ICU length of stay is almost 50% if a patient goes into respiratory compromise. So again, I'm looking at this from a surgical standpoint. I want to show you some things that other people have been doing. They weren't necessarily looking uh, at respiratory compromise per se, but they were looking for people who went into respiratory failure after surgery and they did some data to look these things up. The first thing we did in the Respiratory Compromise Institute is look at years of hundreds of thousands of Medicare patients. Now Medicare takes care of all looking at all this data. You have to put that in to get paid, so you have to input um, Patient data, it indicates whether or not a patient went into respiratory failure while in the hospital, got intubated, or got put on mechanical ventilation. And we look specifically if this was done after surgery in this case, uh, or versus in other ones, just medical patients. Now, as I said, we looked at several hundred thousand, almost 16, 17,000 medical patients and almost 14,000 surgical patients went into respiratory failure after hospital admission. Their ages were similar. But the mortality, look at the mortality here. 33% of medical patients who go into respiratory failure after hospital admission die. 25% of surgical patients who get uh, it, go into respiratory failure after surgery die. And the mortality, if you don't die in hospital, those 33 and 25%, you have to add another 15% to the medical patients. So you're looking at almost a 50% mortality within a month of a patient going into respiratory failure after admission. Surgery patients add another 10%, so 35%, one out of three surgery patients who go into respiratory failure after surgery die. Those are terrible. Luckily, it's not many, but they do badly. Now, several people have done some work on this. This is one of the uh, earlier papers I found. It was published in Chess in 2011. There's two years of NASQIP the National Surgical Quality Insur uh, Improvement uh, Program. They looked at 469,000 patients. Um, originally, they started out with one year and said, okay, we've got, we're looking at all the patients whose data was inputted into our NASQIP uh, system. So they had over 2,010 patients to look at, and they looked for what did these people have in common among those who went into respiratory failure. Getting that data, they went then for the next year and prospectively looked to see if they could validate those findings. The end point, of course, was respiratory failure uh, postoperatively, 
So if you require mechanical ventilation greater than 48 hours after surgery or unplanned intubation within 30 days of surgery. Again, whenever you look at all these papers, I, I have to say this uh, and remind you, is that all these papers have little different definitions of what is respiratory failure and when it occurs. So it's, it's not apples and oranges, but it is a little different between the different papers. So what did they find in this? Out of that NASQIP data, only 3.1%, but almost 6,500 patients developed postoperative respiratory failure. There, as you would expect, there's a significantly higher mortality of 25% versus less than 1% in the people who didn't go into respiratory failure. And what they found, going back through, it says, the, our predictors are what kind of surgery do you have? Um, being that if you had major abdominal, major vascular, or thoracic surgery would be uh, a highest predictor. Are you having an emergency case? And in that way, those people you would imagine, you think about it afterwards, yes, they're more than likely to a higher likelihood to go into respiratory failure because nobody's has to prepare these people for surgery. They weren't ready for surgery. They needed the surgery now. There is what they call the dependent functional status. What kind of shape was the patient in otherwise beforehand? If you have a poor debilitated patient, they are at higher risk for all different types of postoperative complications and respiratory failure certainly too. Uh, one that was particular only in this paper that I really saw, although it does come up again later uh, in a, a different type of paper, was preoperative sepsis. If your patient is already septic before they have surgery, they are higher at risk. And the other one is what they call a higher ASA, American Society of Anesthesiologists class. And that is uh, a class I'll, I'll discuss with you. And here it is. The American Society of Anesthesiologists physical status has been used uh, for decades now. Uh, and it allows anesthesiologists, and surgeon, surgeons also use this, as a way of comparing patients somewhat. If I say I've got an ASA-1 patient, everybody kind of knows what that means. Um, now, I work uh, mainly at a VA hospital, and I can tell you in the last full year that I worked, um, I noted three ASA-1 patients. Um, VA patients are, are older, have other comorbidities, so there are not too many of them that are ASA-1. An ASA-2 patient, mild systemic disease, that could be something as mild as they're a current smoker, uh, not having any symptoms with it, not having any other problems, but that's enough to say that they're not in absolute best case. Um, they could have some other mild diseases, but not too bad. An ASA-3 is what we call, it is a severe systemic disease, but it's not life-threatening at the moment. So you have somebody who is a diabetic on insulin, uh, somebody with a diagnosis of COPD, uh, a vascular patient who's already had some vascular uh, problems. Um, we go to an ASA-4, and this is a patient who has that same type of severe systemic disease, but now it has progressed to the point where it's a constant threat to life. Um, those patients, of course, are sick. Now, in the VA, most of our patients are three, threes, uh, a few fours for certainly. Um, we also, of course, had a few ASA fives. Now, they've changed that over the years. When I was a resident uh, 30 years ago, an ASA five was a patient who was we thought was probably going to die whether or not they had surgery in the next 24 hours. So the idea was, was we're going to try to save them with surgery, but we're not expecting them to make it. wouldn't be a surprise. And we've added an ASA-6. Uh, this is a patient who comes for an organ donation. Um, didn't know how to actually qualify those in the past. But So here's another study that was done looking at this. This is out of Mass General, almost 30,000 surgical patients. Only 137 of them were reintubated within three days of surgery. So that only 137, 0.41% um, went into what we could, would consider the extreme form of respiratory compromise. They had to be reintubated and put in mechanical ventilation. Of those 137, they did very well with them. Only 22 died, or 
But of all the rest of the patients, if none of those other patients, so 29,000 or 29,800 and about 90 or so patients, they were not reintubated and their mortality was only 0.26% versus the 16%. Significant difference. In this study, the independent predictors of reintubation were, again, the ASA 3 or above study, emergency surgery came up again, the high risk surgical service, again, that major abdominal, thoracic, uh, major vascular. So, this is one of the, the first ones that came up and included a history of congestive heart failure. Now, that's easily noted if you have somebody who comes in right now in, in heart failure or they were in heart failure two days ago uh, when they were seen uh, and by another doctor and you treated them diuresis, maybe uh, did some other changes in their care, and they're, quote, not in congestive heart failure when they show up for surgery, it's question, it, the question I have in this paper, would they still be considered of having uh, that problem? So a history of congestive heart failure is bad. Current congestive heart failure is really bad. And this one also included chronic pulmonary disease. So pretty easy to pick out, uh, but significant problems. Now, it was, a, it was an easy type thing to do. There was only, of the five things you could have, the SA score, the emergency, what type of surgery, if you're congestive heart failure, or chronic pulmonary disease, you got points of either 3, 3, 2, 2, or 1. So you could only get 11 points total. That makes it fairly simple to do. Now, when they looked at this and did their work, they said, okay, now we're going to go back and look at patients, see how they do. And again, on the bottom right, on, on the blue, again, here, here's where the point values come. If you have zero points, meaning there's something totally out of the blue, this patient had n none of these uh, pre precipitating factors, there was only a 0.12% chance of requiring reintubation. Very low. You got to figure out what exactly happened to that patient. Uh, it have to be something odd or, or really very, very rare. Now, if you had one to three points, which could have been again just a history of COPD and uh, maybe just the high risk service. So, if you have those two, you've already got three points. You have about a half percent chance of requiring reintubation. One out of two hundred. Again, a small number, but significant if you do enough of those cases. When you get to four to six points, and now we're looking, let's say you have an ASA score of three, you're in a high risk service, that gives you five points already, you have over one and a half percent chance of requiring reintubation. And if you get seven to 11 points, again, let's do it an ASA three, emergency procedure three, oh, excuse me, went one too far, emergency procedure three, and then COPD giving you seven points already, you've got an almost 6% chance of reintubation. Almost one out of 15 patients who has those three com combination of points are going to need to be reintubated. That starts getting on the radar of your hospital administrators and your surgical M&M &M, uh, committee looking at things. What they also do from this study was what else was going on when these patients, when they were intubated? The first, the point system tells what happened. Where were they? What kind of patient were they? Uh, did they have a history of this or that and stuff? But if you had any of these problems at the time of intubation, they just kept track of them. So 50% had pulmonary edema at the time they were re-intubated. Now that could have been from their congestive heart failure. They, of course, could have been having a uh, arrhythmias, could be fluid overload, a lot of different things. Almost 40-something percent had a history of atelectasis. Again, take a thoracic surgery patient and give them a history of COPD, and you can imagine they would all have a high incidence of aspiration. We already had, they had over 25% of pneumonia already in these cases. So now you're looking at patients sitting there and saying, I've got a patient who's post-op, major vascular, major thoracic surgery. He's got a history of CHF, and two or three days after surgery or less, he's got a pneumonia already. 
you know they're going to be reintubated or have different problems. Some of the other problems are a little impaired brain function with this cognitive dysfunction after surgery. Did they have a history of stroke? They have delirium for being in the ICU. Uh, any one of those could have added to that. Now, 20% aspirated. And you got to wonder about, well, were they being fed too soon? Did they have problems just trying to clear their secretions that added to, added to aspiration? Or what? It, it wasn't noted, but these are different things they found. Airway obstruction. Did they, you know, was their brain function so low they could not prevent, you know, control their airway? which also comes up under preventive measure here was we're going to intubate this patient because they're having trouble with airway. The anesthesia related ones, they included a residual neuromuscular blockade, possibly too high of a, you know, a, a narcotic dosing intraop so that they did not feel good enough just reversing that, but the patient were not, was not waking up enough and they felt they needed to be Reintubated to make sure everything was better. Uh, hypotension, of course, can happen. Pulmonary embolism doesn't happen very often. Not much we can do sometimes about it. It happens immediately. Uh, if you ask anesthesiologists who do these type of cases, you can have these pulmonary emboli intraoperatively. Um, and when you find out at the end of the case that those patients aren't going to do well and try to extubate them, of course, an MI or a, a cardiac arrest. So this is what they found in their patients. They picked them out and said these are preoperative factors, and they gave them points for that. And they said, okay, this is what happened, what we found when we reintubated them. So you can see how sick these patients were. Now, there was another study uh, published in anesthesiology. It came out of this RISCAT group, and we'll look at that a couple times. They originally did almost 2,500 patients. They looked at postoperative pulmonary complications of respiratory infection, respiratory failure, bronchospasm, atelectasis, pleural effusion, pneumothorax, or aspiration pneumonitis. Again, it, it is postoperative post pulmonary complications, not the same type of things that the other papers were looking for. So it's not, not quite apples and oranges again, but it's not apples and apples. They found 252 events, so several in 123 patients. So several, some patients had more than one of these happen. It had occurred about 5% uh, of all their patients. The two, uh, half of the 10% had some kind of problem, or I'm sorry, take that back. There are 252 in, incidents in one out of every 20 patients. Um, the 30-day mortality was significant again, 20% versus less than 5.5% uh, with no uh, postoperative pulmonary complications. And there, what they looked for was something not included previously, was what was the low pre-op arterial oxygen saturation? Now, as an anesthesiologist, for a normal patient, we take the patient in the operating room, we're putting on all our monitors, about the same time we're having them start to breathe some extra oxygen as we put the SAT monitor on them. It's not too often that in the pre-op clinic uh, that people would put on a SAT monitor on them and see what these people look at. They did that in this study, and I know a number of places where they include that as a routine part of their preoperative evaluation now, but it wasn't, you know, many years ago. Uh, a second, uh, the second thing that came out with the acute respiratory infection during the previous month, that is something you would know. If you look at all these, all except number seven, uh, or six and seven, you would know beforehand, and you looked at the first five, low sat, respiratory infection, how old they are, and the older the, older the patient, worse it was, preoperative anemia, the lower the hemoglobin level beforehand, the worse off. Again, the type of surgery, that abdominal or intrathoracic. All those things, are they're not controllable per se, but there are something that you know before you go into surgery, so you know that these patients have a higher risk um, once you've looked at your types of patients. Longer surgery uh, added to the, the risk, and emergency surgery again. So they looked at back at that in 2010. Now, what they found in their general comp, uh, conclusions were, as you expect, these postoperative pulmonary complications, they contribute to the overall risk of surgery. They end up with substantially longer stays in the hospital and higher in-hospital in postoperative mortality. They didn't note the 
post-discharge mortality, uh, but you can imagine from our earlier studies that I noted that those were also higher too. Now, this same group came back about four years later and published in anesthesiology, um, and they were looking at this data and going through things, and they um, validated their scores. And I don't have to go through the whole study and everything here, but what was interesting is, and they had a number of hospitals, uh, I believe 64 different hospitals, but those seven factors differed in how important they were in different geographic areas. And more so than in, say, geographic areas, it wasn't like one hospital out of the 64 had a higher risk thoracic surgery program, and that's what led to it. Um, so there is some other things going on uh, that we, we probably can't control for, but you, that's one at the end. I'm going to talk about whether or not you should do some of these studies yourself, and that's one of the reasons to do it. Um, what somebody else finds may not pertain, pertain completely to your patient group. Now, when they did this study, as I said, it was 63 hospitals in 21 different countries, about 6,000 patients, and they came up with a complicated uh, preoperative scoring system. You got more points for being older, 16 if you're over 80. If your preoperative saturation was less than 90%, you got 24 points. Um, if you had a respiratory infection in the last month, yes or no, it's worth 17 points. As you can see, all the way down, you get 0 to 8, 0 to 23 or whatever. Now, when you look at as to how bad things were, a low risk was less than 26 points. Well, if you had a 80-year-old patient who sat was 89%, they've got 40 points walking into the OR they're already at moderate risk. If you add that with a pre-op respiratory infection uh, or a lower hemoglobin, they're in the high group right off the bat. You know that when you're going in. The problem with that is that look at the scoring system. Nobody's going to memorize the scoring system. Uh, it needs to be something simpler for your patients. Now, in a computerized pre-op lab, you might be able to sit there and just put the data in and it'll tell you that back right away, but you have to give it the right data. You have to know what you're looking for in your particular patients. But this one was a complicated one, although it did seem to work. They found 224 out of their about 6,000 patients uh, developed postoperative respiratory failure. Again, the in-hospital in mortality was 10% versus less than a half percent among those who didn't suffer respiratory failure. And so again, just like everybody else, it is a very bad thing to happen for your patient. Now, they went back through and again in 2015 presented more data and everything, um, looked at another group of, of people. Um, again, the low preoperative SAT, uh, they had seen that before, so they were looking for that. They went down to just a preoperative respiratory symptom. It didn't have to have respiratory failure before or a pneumonia, but something in, in recent history uh, gave them a symptom. Now, this is the only paper that showed that chronic liver disease uh, was a problem. But whether or not other people were specifically looking for that is hard to tell because they don't bring it up in their papers. Here again, a history of congestive heart failure, very high on that. The open intrathoracic, now we have to go open intrathoracic. You can do uh, intrathoracic or upper abdominal uh, laparoscopically, and the risk isn't as high. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we do those. They're not, as an anesthesiologist, they weren't my favorite cases when we were doing a laparoscopic intrathoracic case, the video uh, thoracoscopy. Um, but they do have a, a lower risk overall. Again, Longer surgeries and emergency surgeries add to your risk. Now, this is, this is changing the subject a little bit here. Um, so going from what do your patients look preoperative and stuff, what we're looking at as a definition of postoperative respiratory failure, one of which is an unplanned intubation. These people had surgery. They're out of surgery. They should do, be doing well. But what happens to them afterwards? So this is the second thing 
you, you should be looking for at your home institution is who gets intubated uh, that you weren't expecting. Who's out on the floor? Who's in the ICU and gets re-intubated after surgery? Well, you can imagine uh, here is that patients who were septic, and here they got septic at an average about eight days after surgery. These people were not doing well. That's not surprising they had to get re-intubated. Again, an aspiration or pneumonia shows up often uh, on post-operative day zero to four, but almost 30% of them had aspiration and pneumonia by that time already. Part of that was tied to excessive secretions. Uh, almost 10% of the patients had excessive secretions. They can't clear their secretions. What does that lead to? It leads to pneumonia, um, and there you set the whole thing going again. So you need to have uh, be reintubated. It can happen anywhere from zero to four days. Uh, it may be as they're mobilizing fluid. It may be as they're starting to take in uh, PO intake, uh, but all those different things. And fluid overload uh, wasn't seen as many patients, and I think that's probably um, something you see much less now than you did 30 years ago. Uh, I can tell you we certainly do anesthesia differently as far as the amount of IV fluids we give people uh, in, in those 30 years, so I would hope that would be down. Uh, again, it happens when the first couple of days, maybe as they're mobilizing that that fluid, so patients have trouble uh, taking care of that. But it is something, again, to look for in your patients. Now, this was one, I know there has been a, uh, uh, at least one other webinar from the Respiratory Compromise Institute, uh, and it, its subject was looking at neuromuscular blockers. And one of the things that it has become very important over the years to us is that uh, when you have surgery and a surgeon needs relaxation for his surgery, an upper abdominal big operation there, you need complete relaxation. Well, are they completely uh, reversed? Is all the neuromuscular blocking agent gone when you're trying to get these people uh, and you extubate them? Are they able to breathe up as to the highest of their own ability? And if they have residual neuromuscular blocking agents on board, they are going to have problems. And so we look for that. Now, most of the time, we think that it is of the uh, non-depolarizing um, agents and stuff. But there was a paper that just came out in the British, British Journal of Anesthesia. And I, I know some of these authors, and I, I know where they're from, so it, that's the reason I paid attention to this. I said, I never would have thought this. But they looked at 13,000 patients. But 5.4 of those patients had a postoperative pulmonary complication. That's, again, within realm of what we were looking at, uh, the, some of these people. Their pulmonary complication ranged anywhere from desatting to less than 90% within seven days or being requiring reintubation. So anywhere in between there. So... Um, Five and a half percent of those patients of the 13,000 suffered any of those problems. And when they went back afterwards to look, they said, what else is going on? And they had the same type of thing. Uh, there's history of CHF. Uh, they were didn't sat well beforehand. They're older, big, big operations, long operations. But what they also found, which was very uh, interesting and very surprising, was in the patients who got succinylcholine, the, in it increased their risk by 11%. Let me go back here. Sorry again. But that the use of succinylcholine, everybody you know who's listening to this should be fairly aware of succinylcholine being basically a very short-acting agent. Uh, we would give this a, a, a surgical operation where we might want to intubate quickly, um, and they may or may not need any relaxation afterwards. Or if I, I need to intubate somebody quickly, I'll give them succinylcholine. We intubate them with that. And for the rest of the surgery, we would use a non-depolarizing uh, neuromuscular blocking agent, uh, which we, we would then reverse at the end of the case. Uh, and we knew, and we do know, that there are people who genetically are more um, affected by succinylcholine. You can have the complete inability to break this down. It's a plasma esterase, esterase that breaks it down. Pseudocolon esterase uh, breaks down succinylcholine, and that's basically how it goes away. You can have either 
basically none of that esterase or a very low performing esterase. And we thought if you had none of it, you probably, you might be still very relaxed up to four to five hours after getting one dose of this. Um, some of the other people, instead of it lasting five or 10 minutes, if you were looking at the neuro, neuromuscular blocking uh, monitor uh, shortly after giving the succinylcholine, and you'd sit there and say, well, I gave it 10 minutes ago, and it still seems to be rather weak. And then 15 minutes and 20 minutes and 20-something minutes, and it looks like they're completely back from it. You say, okay, they just low level, not a real big deal. But saying that 11% of people uh, who got succinylcholine are at increased risk gives the implication that maybe that little bit of weakness uh, makes a difference. Now we do know that if you have uh, a succinylcholine induced block and you try to give reversal agents, you can actually prolong uh, the succinylcholine block. So if you, without knowing it, gave succinylcholine, intubated the patient, 10, 15, 20 minutes later, you use a nerve stimulator, and it looks like they're all the way back. So you then give a, a non-depolarizing agent, uh, which you then reverse several hours later. If you didn't know and aren't aware that that succinylcholine was still having an effect, you reverse the non-depolarizer, but then you actually make the succinylcholine last longer. So this is something we're going to have to look for in the future. Um, We'll have to see if somebody else can and can duplicate this study. That, that'll be interesting and something we hadn't thought about. So what do you do with this? Now, here's all these studies. These are what these people have found, fairly big studies. Um, they try to validate them. And one of the things, as I try to point out, is while there are several things that are common among the studies, whether it's... Uh, and more elderly patient or highest ASA standard or such. There was only one study that mentioned liver, you know, problems. Um, only a couple mentioned whether or not you had a, a recent post uh, preoperative uh, infection in your lungs beforehand. So if you are in a busy surgical service and you're worried about this because you look back at your own data, what would you know? Look back at last year's data. Of the last couple of years, this would be the easiest way to do it. Uh, if you can get somebody who wants to sit in medical records or whatever for a while, how many patients were reintubated postoperatively? Who were they? Where were they reintubated? When and why? So, which surgical patients? You'd probably look at again the major surgical services. Uh, podiatry doesn't reintubate a lot of people afterwards, but thoracic and major vascular probably have a few more than others. Where were they reintubated? Were they still in the ICU because they had a very big operation? Or were they out on the floor almost ready to go home? And then when? Was it within the first 24 hours of surgery? Or the first couple hours of surgery? Or was it day two, three, four, five, and six when other problems become evident? And then why? What were those problems? What precipitated that cause? You need that data because if you look at it and said, you know, we did... 10,000 operations in our hospital last year, and we only reintubated 15 of those 10,000 uh, within a week of surgery, you're probably done. You probably can't come up with enough information about those 50 patients to do a prospective study. There's not enough information from those 15. But if you look and sit there and say, boy, out of 10,000 patients, we had, you know, 100, 125, 150 patients who were reintubated after surgery. Now you're looking to sit there and say, we may have a problem. We need to study to find out and find out who are these patients. So you, you pick out that number. Do that look back in history and see how many numbers we're talking about. Look at those patients and look at your average patients. And you can either, you know, look at the the scoring systems are mass general or whatever with the, the 11 points or not and pick out those things. Or you can do your own data at the same time and say, which one of these patients I think have a higher risk? Now, I'm not saying you're going to put all your thoracic, all your major vascular 80-year-old um, patients uh, who are diabetic and have COPD in the ICU for the first two weeks after surgery. You can't do that. 
But if you have patients who meet all those qualifications that I, I just listed, you probably are going to put them in the ICU for a while. And But what about the other people who aren't quite that bad? What are the ones that any, you know, there are people, as I was saying, that list, anybody can pick those patients out. But what about the ones not anybody can pick out? What, what's different about those? Is it a, a mild diabetic is not too bad, but a bad diabetic you ought to be looking at longer? That's what you have to look at your data and do that study and figure out what it is. Um, and then you have to do the calculations. You're going to go back to your administration or your head of surgery and stuff and say, you know, we may have a problem. We think we can do something. We think we can make things better. We can pick out patients uh, as early as possible, a, a lot of them preoperatively, and those are the ones that are higher risk. If we can do the extra work, spend some money, whether it's on monitors or personnel, we can avoid people going into respiratory failure after surgery uh, or with that increased uh, mortality that they have. But you need the information to do that. If you go to your hospital administrator and say, you know, I, I'm guessing maybe 2 or 3% of our patients may get problems. So if you give me monitors to put on all 10,000 of my post-op patients, um, I can probably save a couple patients. I don't know where you work, but I don't think any administrator is going to buy that. But if you can come up to them and say, based on our data, I can pick out 90% of the people in a preoperative evaluation who are most likely to have postoperative respiratory problems. And those are the ones I need to monitor because of that number, 2 to 5 to 10 percent are going to get significant problems. And if I'm monitoring them, I can avoid or alleviate most of those problems by picking those patients out beforehand and upping their level of care. That's something we'd all like to do. And that's, again, the respiratory compromise is something we think we can mitigate with the right information. So I hope this gives you a place to start from. Again, look at your patients and decide if you have a problem. Look at those studies I've included in here and see where your hospital fits. And I think if you do it right and everything, uh, as some of these other institutions have done, they're lowering their mortality, they're lowering their length of stay, and they're taking better care of their patients. And you can do that too. I hope this has helped. Hope everybody's doing well. Everybody take care. And I hope to see you at some in-live meetings in the near future. Thank you.